Yeah. All right, my friends. Well, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. Welcome to our latest uh, online event. Today's topic is about the Israeli arms industry. It's a very big topic, but a very important one, and I'm very excited to be joined today by Jonathan, who's going to introduce himself in just a couple of minutes. Um, before I introduce you to Jonathan, um, let me just say a couple of words by way of introduction. Um, I think almost everybody in the audience today is a, is a Green Olive uh, supporter, member, or at least someone associated with Green Olive. Uh, if this is your first time on an event with us, or if maybe you're watching this event on YouTube later on, welcome. Uh, Green Olive is a Israeli-Palestinian social cooperative with 11 working partners on the ground in Israel-Palestine, uh, working using tours, both physical and virtual, to educate people about the realities of life under occupation. Uh, our aim is to promote a better vision for the future, one where the occupation is over, based on democratic values and respect for human rights. And today's event, uh, I think, touches on all of those kind of broad topics. Uh, and I hope that by the end of today's event, we'll all understand a little bit more just how interconnected uh, all of these topics are and just how important the kind of military industry is uh, to Israel and how the occupation is a big part of kind of testing and marketing that. Uh, my name is Alex. If you've not met me before, it's nice to meet you. I'm the VP of, of Green Olive, and I'm going to be co-hosting this event today. Uh, with a good friend of mine uh, and an expert on the Israeli arms industry. Um, Jonathan, would you maybe like to introduce yourself uh, just in a couple of words before we begin? Yes, um, so hello everyone. Really nice to, to see you all here. Um, so I'm Jonathan, I'm uh, right now in Tel Aviv. Um, I'm a researcher and activist um, and I'm the co-creator of uh, the database for um, of Israeli military and security export. So I'm uh, really dealing a lot uh, on the Israeli arms trade and the Israeli military industry, but also working um, for a feminist anti-militarist movement and doing educational work on militarism inside the Israeli society. But today I'm here with uh, just the head of, of uh, Israeli arms export and I want to talk with you about the um, Israeli military industry, but also about how Israeli arms are involved in different countries and human rights relations, but also to show the connection to the occupation, the situation here and how it's all connected and uh, who makes profit out of it. Um, yeah, let, let me know if you want to start, Alex, if we, you're Thank ready. You. Uh, I just say um, there will be a lot of information, but of course we cannot go into every um, detail of every country that we're exporting to, but we'll try to to show different study cases and show a little bit of, of different um, yeah different perspectives of this this topic. Um, but in the all around the world, right? Question. Yeah. Um, I'll just add a couple of words about the kind of practicality of today's event. Most of you have been with us before, so nothing new. Uh, but our scheduled time today is ninety minutes. Uh, we're going to have time at the end for questions uh, and kind of comments uh, discussion. So if during the event you have questions either for, for Jonathan or me, uh, feel free to type them in the chat as, as we're going along. And then at the end of the presentation that Jonathan's going to give us, uh, we'll kind of cover all of those. Um, like all of our online events, there is no fee for registration, uh, but we encourage everybody at the end of the event to contribute whatever you felt today's session was worth. Uh, big or small, it all makes a massive difference, as you may or may, or may not know, um, the borders have closed again because of the Omicron variant. So we're really hoping that we get a, a bit of a season to be able to welcome some of you folk into Israel-Palestine. Uh, but for now, uh, any you know, contributions that you'd like to make on the basis of um, how much you enjoyed these events are very greatly appreciated. Here is the link uh, for making contributions at the end. And this event, like all of our events, 10% uh, of all the contributions go towards the PCRF, Palestine Children's Relief Fund, an amazing charity which provides um, medical care, especially to, to kids in places that just wouldn't get it otherwise. Um, so as well as supporting our two organizations, you'll also be supporting them. So we thank you very much in advance for any contributions you'd like to make at the end. Um, so unless there are any questions before we begin, 
I am going to share my screen and show you how we will begin. I just say, um, I, just to explain for who I'm working, so the delegated is part of, um, of the organization American Friends Service Committee of the uh, Quakers organization and for whom I'm working. Um, yeah, and for more information, of course, I will share with you the, the link at the end and also um, if you want different other sources. Um, but yeah, I want to start, um, just a second, yeah. So I want to start to say that over the last decades, Israel has, um, and different reports say that um, Israel sold weapons to around 130 countries um, all over the world. Uh, it's a huge number. And yet, um, when one digs a little, it's impossible to find the full list of those countries. Um, apart from its reports to the United Nations Register of Conventional Arms, Israel releases no official information about its arms exports. There's no transparency. Um, and today, that's what we're trying to, that, that would, what is what I try to do with you to get today. I want to dig a little bit into all those uh, arms uh, deals and this industry. And that is actually also what the database will, um, is doing. And we will show you the database also at the, at the end. Um, but just um, general information. So Israel, um, like I said, is, um, sorry, just a second. Um, um, so yeah, the arms export um, for Israel is worth 9.2 billion in 2017. It's actually went a little bit up. Um, I can also, sh there will be a little bit of numbers. It's really hard to, to imagine what, what those numbers actually are saying. But um, the, big, the three biggest arms companies in Israel made last year in 2020 in Corona times and COVID times um, $10 billion. Three companies did $10 billion from arms export. Um, with um, yeah, with uh, Israel being in 2019 the eighth, eighth largest arms exporter worldwide, and that's actually not in relation to population; it's in general. Um, and over 75% um, of Israeli military production is for export. And just to show a number, and we'll talk about drones a little bit more. And 60% of all drones are supplied by Israel. Um, Israel is actually number one um, num number one drones exporter, a producer and exporter in the world. Um, that's just a few big numbers. I know it's not saying it's not saying too much, but um, it's important to just start with with the the yeah with the general um, information. But I want to start with the number one import, like the number one customer of Israel, um, and that is India. Um, it it's actually interesting because Israel, um, Israel's ever-growing arms industry has shifted its, its focus from the West. In the past, it was Europe and the, Amer and the Americas, Latin America and, uh, and North America as its main clients. And now it shifted to the East with India being the largest importer of, of arms. Um, Vietnam is in the list, it's the third. And uh, Indonesia, Philippines, um, we'll talk a little bit about it also later. But India, India, and um, here's a picture of, of, um, of Netanyahu, the former um, prime minister that I have a really close connection with Modi um, um, from India. And Israel has been among the top four arms suppliers to India for almost two decades now. So it's not a new, it's not completely a new um, uh, trend. Um, with military sales was $1 billion every year. It's a crazy number. Um, and the relationship is further strengthened by the, by the manufacturing of Israeli arms actually in India itself. So Israel has already arms uh, manufacture, um, arms uh, factories in India. And um, of course, India using, um, like in this picture, there was a research about um, um, Indian fighter jets using um, new bombs that Israel was manufacturing in India. Um, on, on different conflicts and also spyware. Um, so that is um, with India. You can also go to the next picture. I want to go a little bit more fast. That's one of the, that is the spice bomb that, that Israel was uh, manufacturing in India. Um, here is a, a case that actually was last week. Um, it's in a, country, in a region in India. It's called Nagaland, um, where Israel, um, like you see in this picture, and a lot of research is actually visual research in, in our, um, in our um, work. Um, it's not me that I analyze this picture, but um, other researchers. 
and they found out that uh, Israeli and small small arms were um, were and trade like were sold to to India to Nagaland police. And last week, just and also if, when I'm when I'm saying that they're involved, not always we have proof that the actual weapons were involved in a conflict or in a massacre or in an attack. But the region that last week um, um, and a massacre in was conducted on, on civilians um, in this region. And that's the, pol the police has also Israeli arms. So just like to show that Israeli arms are, are present in regions and in security forces that are also um, violating human rights and are, um, yeah, and are actually um, attacking, killing, um, and that's only India. That is um, a drone. Um, also developed by Israel. It's a huge drone that is also attacking. And actually, Israel and India are the only uh, owners of this drone right now. And Germany also did a purchase a kind of drone like that. It's the Heron drone. But Germany um, bought it without an attacking um, option. And they say, and they say that they won't um, um, actually um, yeah, make, it, make it also possible to, to attack. Um, yeah, uh, Alex wanted to show a video that we found. Rafael is um, <clears throat> the, the private, is an Israeli private company. It's the biggest private company of arm, that is producing arms in Israel and, and exporting arms. And they did a video for uh, India, for Indian customers. Um, and I think it could be a good example of how, yeah, how are they doing that? <laughs> so long trusting friends and partners what more can I pledge to make a future strong I need to feel safe and sheltered security and protection commitment and perfection Different A terrible uh, example, but actually, actually, even India, that is a huge customer and uh, friend, they actually were offended, and and Rafael needed to take that down. But in the internet and YouTube, you can find that really easily. Um, it's a catchy song. I'm happy um, to share the links with everyone. By the so way, we, we will talk a little bit about it later. But Israel is putting a lot of efforts in marketing, uh, in exhibitions, arms fairs, of course, brochures and events, and. Um, but we'll talk about the later about this connection and how how these companies are marketing their um, their weapons and their products. Um, and actually, I want to move to with you to the to the second biggest um, customer of Israel of Israeli arms, and that's Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is the second biggest. Um, and after um, and actually for Azerbaijan, Israel has been the country's second largest arms exporter after Russia. So we are number. We are the second also for Azerbaijan after Russia, um, with sales of $790 million uh, in five years. It's a huge amount. Um, and this weapons and tier is interesting. Here you can see a drone that we um, sold to, to Azerbaijan. Um, actually, these weapons, these Israeli weapons, ignore the EU arms embargo that they put in the 90s. Um, and also, the U.S. put a de facto policy not to sell arms to Azerbaijan, and still Israel is selling a lot of arms um, to Azerbaijan. Um, and they're used both in the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and also for domestic repression with the country, within the country itself. In 2016, actually, Netanyahu visited Azerbaijan and announced that the military deals between the two countries had reached $5 billion. Um, and these include drones um, also that were used to bomb uh, Armenia. And here is a video of uh, our video, uh, 
a photograph of a, of a drone that is called a kamikaze drone. It's a drone that, uh, that can be launched from vehicles, but also from ships. And it's actually a drone. And at the end, you can just, um, um, yeah, just attack with it. You can shoot it into, uh, into the target. Um, and that's one of the most terrible, um, I don't know, for me, the inventions of, of uh, the Israeli arms industry. Um, and we saw, we, like Israel saw that to, um, to Azerbaijan. And here actually is a good example also of propaganda. We showed a video like that in India. That's now a different case. That's actually a video that Azerbaijan um, produced, a pop song. And interesting, um, actually researchers used that to analyze that Israel sold the kamikaze drone to um, Azerbaijan. So it's actually also another way of researchers to get information of what arms were sold, what arms are already in the hands of, of different countries. So maybe um, Alex, you can put on and we will see how researchers expose the uh, Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Alex. Good timing. Yeah, here you can see um, the proof, the proof that um, that actually Azerbaijan is using, or in this case, not it's not a proof that they used it on on a, on a specific target, but it's 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 a proof that they have it uh, in their uh, that their army has it. It's the Kamikaze drone launched from a from a launcher, and that's sometimes enough to to have the, the final proof. And, uh, Yeah. Um, Jonathan, can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Do you know if, I mean, you talked about the use of these weapons, but do you know if they've been used in the recent war? You know, they just had the conflict around the Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan? Yeah, so actually, yeah, from the beginning of the of the uh, of the the conflict, um, that uh, by the way, um, was a really really violent one and really terrible. Um, over five thousand soldiers of both sides were um, died, and at least uh, one hundred fifty civilians were killed on both sides. Ten thousand more displaced by the fighting and um, uh, refugees, and. Um, and actually, an Israeli reporter also, and his name is Itai Engel, is really famous here. He actually revealed um, also the large role that Israeli drones, like this kamikaze drone, um, played in the war um, between between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And here's also a picture that not, not it's not from him, but it's one of the proofs that uh, that the kamikaze drone was used um, in this conflict. There are a lot of different journalists that were on the ground that found different materials and and. Um, um, yeah, proof of, of this of this uh, product of drones, attacking drones, um, and actually also in Israel, the Armenian community there is a uh, an Armenian community in Israel. They also protested against it, um, and of course all over the world there was a lot of protest against uh, not only against the conflict, but or on the, on this conflict, but also against the involvement of Israeli arms. There were not only this kamikaze drones. There were a lot of Israeli arms and military equipment that was involved in this uh, in this bloody conf in conflict. Um, and sadly, it's not the first time, of course, that Israel is involved in a, in a terrible conflict. Are there um, other examples like that where Israel is using you know, these weapons, or not Israel, sorry, uh, I speak. Other countries are using Israel's weapons in you know, really active cases where atrocities are being committed and human rights are being violated? Is that other examples? Yes, I mean, there are a lot. There's from Rwanda to... Um, I don't know, to um, Chile, the dictatorship in Chile and in Argentina, but I think Myanmar is a really good example for, um, for the last, I don't know, 10 years. Um, so Myanmar, um, I'm, I'm not going into the, the conflict and the, into the crimes against the Rohingya Muslim minority, um, but it's also a terrible, um, terrible example. Thousands were killed um, of this Muslim minority. Um, I think one one million or more than one million uh, have fled, and um, actually a lot of countries and the UN and uh, um, 
actually I think also the US um, um, condemned it and, and, and declared different arms embargoes since the 90s actually on Myanmar. And despite that, Israel has been accused of continuing to sell military equipment to the Myanmar military. Um, and also after it faced accusations of war crimes against the Rohingya. So even after that, there's proof that Israel continued to sell. Actually, in Israel, there were human rights um, defenders and then activists and, and lawyers that so went to court. And there was also public, um, there were public protests. And at the end, the pressure made Israel to declare or to, to officially say that they will not sell anymore. Um, but in a second, I will show that we still continue, that Israel still continued. And um, so Israeli arms export actually between 2000 and 2017 included um, naval guns, towed guns, armed vehicles, petrol vessels. Here is a good example of Myanmar delegation um, in Israel looking at the um, petrol, like a vehicle, a ship, an attacking ship. And then maybe you can go to the next picture. We see the delivery. Um, it's actually the super, super Dvora vessel. It's a huge um, ship from Israeli aerospace industries. And in 2017, here you can see the delivery. So two years after the delegation, it was already delivered. And 2017, actually, Israel declared that they, they won't sell and deliver arms, but still they continued. Um, and here, this picture, is it's not the same boat. It's a different boat. But here you can see also um, Israeli attacking boats um, being used by the, by the Myanmar military. Um, in 2019, actually, the UN charged an official report, in an official report that Israel was among seven countries. So it's not the only one, but it's among seven countries that sold arms to Myanmar at the time when it should have known that the weapons would be used in, in serious crimes under international law. So they declared Israel knew that their arms would be used in crimes against humanity, and still they continue. It's not only that they were, yeah, I hope that you understand. Um, that is a, um, an Israeli small drone, a mini drone that was found in the woods um, by rebels um, and was photographed. And that was also a proof of activists and researchers to show that it's, it's active there in this, in this area on the Rohingya. Um, and that's actually also an interesting story, this, this photo. So in March 2021, the New York Times reported that that Israeli equipment was used in the coup, in the military coup in February in, in, the state, in, in Myanmar. And actually this picture is showing just a vehicle on the day of the coup um, going to the department there. And it's from an Israeli company called Gaia. It's, uh, it's really doing only, only vehicles. And um, it shows actually a, a product, like a vehicle that was uh, produced only in 2018. So it's showing that Israel declared in 2017 that they will not sell any more um, any military equipment. And then you find um, a 2018 design, designed and produced vehicle um, involved in a military coup. Um, also, drones were um, reported that they were used and also cyber spyware. Um, and actually also, um, here you can see a photo of um, protesters and journalists that were um, that were arrested by the, the government of Myanmar um, using Israeli technology to gather evidence that, that led to their imprisonment. Um, two Reuters journalists actually were imprisoned because of Israel, not because, in use of Israeli um, cyber <clears throat> and made by a, a company that's called Celebrite. And maybe I'll, I'll give you, here is actually a picture of, of a Myanmar delegation in Israel in an arms fair in 2019. So it's also showing the connection is still continuing, the relationship is still continuing. Sorry. <clears throat> but I want to actually, ah, and there were, of course, protests in Israel in the last years. There were a lot of protests on those delegations, on those visits of, of military, um, yeah, and on military relations and those connections. So that's outside of the arms fair. People, um, yeah protesting against it. Um, and I want to show you another example of, of an involvement in really, really terrible human rights violations in South Sudan. We just think. Um, sorry, in South Sudan, also Israel made a huge amount of investment in civil and military infrastructure in South Sudan. 
And actually, since the independence in 2011, Israel continued to sell weapons, surveillance technology, and provided military training and security to South Sudan. Although, again, although the US and the UN passed an arms embargo on the country. So I'm just giving you the extreme um, examples right now, but it's it's showing also it's not there are a lot of more there are a lot more examples. Um, in this photo of uh, Netanyahu, and uh, you can see Netanyahu is the is the president in 2011, was the president of the Republic of South Sudan, and um, actually later <clears throat> there was evidence that Israeli assault rifles um, were in the arsenal of South Sudan military. Um, and they were used in the civil war. You can see a picture of, of an, uh, like how activists um, and researchers analyzed it. Um, and also in this war, it, uh, more than 50,000 people were, were, have been killed and more than 4 million people have fled. Again, Israel is not the only country, it's not the only weapons that are coming from Israel, but we want to show, uh, we want to show a trend, we want to show a, a process and a development that is interesting and will show also why it's, it's special here in this case. Um, you wanted just to show also not only guns and, and small arms, but also why tapping equipment was used um, by South Sudan that is coming from Israel and was used to identify and arrest uh, opponents of the government. Um, everything that I'm saying here is, of course, by really um, reliable sources really big uh, research in, uh, institutions or media um, like New York Times or Washington Post, like everything I'm saying is not from like a, a small Twitter for like a forum or like a Twitter account. So it's all things that were already written and what I'm doing and what my organization is doing, we are connecting the dots. We're connecting all this information and showing the trend, showing like what is the bigger picture, the context and what all these cases are doing together and how it's how it's linked. Um, and another... Yeah. Can I ask a question, Jonathan? Sorry to interrupt again. Um, we saw that picture of Netanyahu with the, the leader of South Sudan. There's kind of this reputation, I think, that Netanyahu's kind of got a thing for these kind of strong men. Maybe we won't, we won't call them quite dictators, but these kind of strong men leaders. We could think of like Orban in uh, Hungary or Modi in India is another example. Um, could you maybe address that a little bit? Is there anyone else you'd add to that list that I've forgotten? Yeah, actually also, I mean, Bolsonaro in Brazil is a crazy example. Um, and the Philippines actually with Duterte is maybe the next um, stop for us because it's also an example of this, this um, really close ties between, it's not only Netanyahu, but Netanyahu and his close relationships to, and, and personal relationships even made it, I don't know, made it, uh, it's a different, it's, an, it's another perspective, another interesting perspective. We're not talking about that today. Um, but actually, the Israel's political and economic ties to the Philippines have also been growing in the last years. And Duterte actually, ah, here's a picture of, of um, Israeli officials, Duterte and Netanyahu also standing there. They actually signed in this visit of Duterte um, more over 20 agreements, 20 official agreements in between the countries, um, agreements that were worth nearly $83 million. It's not only security and military agreements, but they were also part of them. And Israeli arms exports to the um, Philippines include drones, anti-tank missiles, radars, surveillance systems, of course, assault rifles for the police. You can see the theater with a Galil um, rifle, an Israeli rifle. Um, and I don't know if you know the story behind the theater, but the theater loves, loves I don't know, he's, he loves the police, he loves arms, and it's really important for him to show. He's really also proud of his connection to Israel. He said in, one, in, a, in a quotation, he said that uh, from now on, he will be, buy only Israeli products because they're so great. And so, uh, yeah. Um, so this picture is also from the delivery of, of uh, assault rifles to the police there, and that they, were made, they made, made it public. And maybe I'll just say in 2019 alone, Israel sold around $174 million in arms to the Philippines. Um, it's a lot. Um, so, but it's not only ending in this, and I think it's important to say it's not ending only on, on in the, with the products. Israel is also providing training and educational um, education sessions to, to uh, the Philippine army and the police, and they provided it to hundreds of them. And 
and here the connection we also I want to go into the into the human rights relations of, of Duterte and of the Philipp like in the Philippines but it's known for now that between um, 9,000 and 30,000 people have been killed in, in Duterte's um, policy of the war on drugs since 2016 alone um, and there and different evidence shows the use of Israeli rifles actually by the Philippine forces and that were involved in, in arbitrary killings in um, ex yeah, including extrajudicial uh, killings and, and violations of and other violations of human rights. So it's in, here, in this case we actually really have proof also of the uh, involvement. And here we can see the visit of a uh, police, uh, no, of a military general doing a police training um, from from the Philippines in Israel. And maybe I have another picture here. Yeah, and of course, when Duterte visited, there was already protests also outside of the. Actually, Duterte visited even Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial here. So it's, it's so uh, I don't know, cynical <laughs> what's happening there also. And is this being um, just in the Philippines, or is this something which we can see in other places also? What ah the, the, the police, the police, and the crowd management and that kind of thing coming. Yeah, I think the the best example is actually the U.S. Um, the U.S. There was actually a great research also in AFC, my, my the organization that I'm working for. They were part of this this uh, project. I think together with the with Jewish Voice for Peace, and they did the research about um, the deadly the exchange between Israeli and and American police um, units. They found more than thousand police units that were visiting Israel or got training by Israeli forces, and. Um, and it's actually you can you can find it online. It's a great report. They show connections between between repression in the U.S. and in Palestine. And it's interesting. It's not it's not saying that everything that happened in the U.S. Uh, and of course killing of of, of black um, of black and people of color um, are only because of police training by Israel. But it shows also this, this interesting circle and this interesting connection between. Between violence and be between violent practices that are being taught and between units, between different um, security forces, and also that are tried here in the West Bank and then yeah, being taught in, in the US. Here you can see a, uh, it's actually a video also of, um, of a training that the um, US police got from, from Israeli um, yeah, security forces. And um, also there was evidence of, of the same kind of tear gas that was used in Palestine, in the West Bank, used also in protests in the US, and um, also, of course, this counter-terrorism counter -ter -terrorism training, as, as they call it, um, to police departments across the US. And part of this, this police um, practices on, and, um, and different trainings are racial profiling trainings, actually. And so it's also um, researchers have found out that the part of the training is also training on racial profiling um, methods. Racial profiling is when when police is targeting and uh, people in public spaces mostly um, because of the skin color or um, or ethnicity. And here you can see a picture. And um, actually, there are also a lot of videos about it and text. As picture, the first picture was from the from uh, East Jerusalem. And the police um, stopping um, a Palestinian young man, and here in the picture of um, the same methods happening, of course, in the U.S. It's not something new. It's not that Israel invented this kind of method, but the, it's interesting to find out that thousands of units were learning. Also, a lot of um, airports, uh, airport security forces are, are learning methods from the Israeli airport um, security agency. So. It's also the same connection. And um, here is another um, equipment that was bought by different uh, U.S. Um, police units. It's the it's a water restraint system that is having um, a chemical material. It's called skunk. Um, everything that I'm saying you can check also in the database that, that um, we made. Um, but the skunk um, is widely used, uh, mostly in in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Some them also in inside Israel in 48 border, um, but mostly against Palestinians. 
it's it has a terrible smell um it make makes people nauseous and it's ne it was never uh, like yeah it's mostly used on on um, on protests as an uh, anti protest um measurement and it was sold to different countries also india by the way but also to the us um yeah but actually the us is also interesting it's not only interesting because of and thank you <laughs> it's not only interesting because it's it's importing a lot of weapons also from Israel and of course like I said police training and police equipment but of course it's giving also a lot to Israel and I think you know it and I, I won't go inside into the the arms import from the US but it's still it's still important to say that um that um through 2020 for example the US provided Israel with one um 156 billion dollars in military um, and missile defense funding. It's a huge number. 52% of all the foreign military financing is going to Israel. So it's the most like it receives more than, than all other countries in the world combined. Um, it's a crazy number. And it's important to remember that when we talk also about the conflict here, about occupation, it's always to it's important to understand both ways. I think the the best um, example is, of course, the, the amount of bombs that Israel is buying from from the states. Of course, also the fighter jets. I think you can go to the next picture. I just wanted to show um, one of those bombs. Um, that was after that. Like the next picture is showing um, journalists that photographed um, actually the remains. That's after the last attack on Gaza in, in May. So they um, photographed um, bombs that were not explode that, that didn't explode, um, and you can see, of course, people analyzing from which companies, uh, American companies, which bomb is being produced and delivered, and um, of course, you have also the other way, like the other side of the coin, not only the ex export from Israel, but also the the military aid, like like uh, the U.S. is calling, um, and there's another perspective on the the US. The US is not only selling, um, but it's also um, uh, importing a lot of, of different methods and, and equipment. One of them is really, really interesting and it's actually on the Mexican border. And maybe we can go to the next spot. <laughs> no, one before. Sorry. No, it's I think Alex is back. Sorry about that, folks. Don't know what happened. I just lost you for a moment. <laughs> sure, Jonathan took good care of you. You want to continue this? Yeah. Um, so one of them is walls. Um, as you know, Israel built a lot of walls um, in this region here. And we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but um, one of the, the points that we find the exact, the exact technologies now also on the, the Mexican border with the in the US. Actually, in 2019 alone, 55 towers uh, on the wall in between, that's actually both pictures. And one is the, the apartheid wall in, in Palestine and one is the, the border with Mexico in the US. And both companies, uh, Elbit, is not building the wall, but Elbit actually builds the surveillance and and um, the surveillance systems on the and the technological systems on the border. You can see an example in the on the in the US. And the first deal was in 2014 with Elbit, 145 million dollars deal, and and later there were additional contracts. And also drones are flying on the border in Mexico. So of course. Um, um, by the US and um, like I said, towers like surveillance towers, 55 were built and or deployed on, in 2019 alone. And so we see the same, the same, yeah, the same connection between like equipment that is used here and this later um, being um, purchased by by different countries. In this case, the US and the militarization of borders. Um, another aspect is not only the militarization of the, the physical border. But it's actually um, contracts that uh, we saw 
being made by, by ICE, by the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and that it was signed contracts up to $30 million with an Israeli cyber company called Celebrite. And they're actually really simply, they're just hacking phones of immigrants. Um, and um, by that, taking evidence from where they came and um, and including more doing unlawful mass pushbacks of, of hundreds of and thousands of, of asylum seekers through different um, technologies, not only this, this one um, um, phone hacking device, but uh, also others. And um, as you know, it's not new. The authorities, the authorities of course, detain asylum seekers um, and um, yeah, in 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 human um, um, conditions, and um, yeah, as a punishment also a lot of times. And um, actually, I'm not making so much. Like, also, in 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 prison systems, Israeli technologies are involved, but I think I, I won't get into that now. It's too much. Um, but it's the same utilization of borders. Um, and we can go to Europe, actually, um, Alex. The same. We see the same process also. Um, with the EU, actually, um, the Israeli arms industry is part of a, actually of a, of a global process of, of border militarization, um, and it's all actually leading to further displacement. Of course, more migration, more people seeking refuge. It's all. It's not the struggles for freedom of, of movement, and we need to we, we need to see both sides of the coin also here. That um, yeah, what is making people to flee, but also how countries and institutions are um, preventing from them. That's a, that is a picture of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, we see a lot, a lot of Israeli arms and um, military equipment um, being bought by the EU, actually, and also by European countries. So also the EU as an, institu like, as an institution or as an actor, but also different countries, Greece, Italy, and for example, Germany, UK. And they're all buying Israeli drones, fences, um, police training, cybersecurity, and surveillance systems. And a lot of them are being used to prevent um, from migrants and asylum seekers to, to enter Europe. And also, and funding is crazy. Europe is funding research and development um, projects in, for billions um, from Israel to further develop strategies, not strategies, technologies that are. Um, that will be later involved on those borders. Um, yeah, that's only one example. Celebrate, by the way, the, the same companies that, that, is, that ICE is using, and they're also being used in the UK by the immigration um, um, office, and also in Germany and in Georgia. In Georgia. Um, so it's already, we see the same process also in, in Europe. Um, and here, another in interesting aspect, it's not only at, at the end, Greece and the EU are using it, on, for example, in this spot on the Greek-Turkish border um, to, to prevent from, from migrants to, to enter, but it's also connected to a different topic, and that's actually a gas, a natural gas pipeline, Israel found gas on, on, in their territory, in their sea territory, and, and actually they're now having a huge deal with Cyprus and Greece and Italy to build a pipeline that will bring the gas to Europe. And that is involved with the huge deals with Greece and Cyprus and um, huge arms deals. So it's also this connection between environment, like the, the yeah, the, I say, hurting the environment, um, but including the militarization of, of borders, not only borders, we're giving them ships and drones and um, factories are actually producing now also arms and on the ground and satellites and radars and yeah. And it's a really interesting yeah. connection with the kind of environmental, like the resource exploitation. <coughs> I know Azerbaijan gives a lot of uh, oil to Israel mm -hmm. and maybe this is a good connection to talk a bit about, you know, that great oil rich region, which is the Gulf. And I know that, you know, Israel's relationship with some of those, you know, um, Gulf countries is very connected between the arms industry and the environment. Yes. Um, yeah, maybe I, I just go back, like, just one step back to the 
the normalization agreement. And it's actually interesting that you asked that. Um, in 2020, 2020, I think most of you also know that there was a normalization deal agreement between Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain. And Saudi Arabia is still didn't, still didn't uh, sign one, but it's, it's on the way. And so that was actually establishing an official diplomatic relation between the countries. And there were connections before that. Um, but um, yeah, actually, since 2007, Israeli cyber and security companies have been operating in different ways with the UAE, with the United Arab Emirates. Um, but the agreement, of course, the, since then, the, the relations are really, the, the military ties are really, really close and they're official. Um, that's actually Natanya. <laughs> I don't know why they put the flags for um, for the after this agreement. Actually, here is a photo of an um, UAE cyber company, and that was um, that reports. The media reports said that um, they hired um, Israeli uh, intelligence officers and workers. So, and that's before the agreement. So, just to show um, that also before there were, were close military ties. And um, now in the last think two months ago, one month ago, there was a huge arms fair in Dubai and as well, like you see in the picture, um, the IAI is a huge Israeli company, um, Israeli aerospace industries and also Airbus systems is exhibiting there. And the next picture you can see, maybe you can go to the next picture, that's from the Red Sea that did a huge joint training with the United States also but also with Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates and the first joint, official joint um, military drill um, between Israel and those countries. And back to what we, what you asked actually, that was one of the things that were announced um, from the beginning. I think one month after the, the normalization agreement, Israel and Saudi Arabia actually announced the plan to build a pipeline. Um, but also the UAE um, signed, like, will, and, and one month after that, uh, the, the company that is doing, the Israeli company signed also an agreement with the UAE to transport oil to Elat, to the south, the most, like, the, the city on the south of Israel. Um, and also, there's a huge discussion here on corruption, because this pipeline is a really old one, and the company is really corrupt and not transparent, and that's a different story, but also to show it's always coming together, like in this mutualization, this military ties together with, with um, yeah, I don't know, we like, uh, yeah, like with oil and, and transporting the oil to Europe. So here, and for, for the Saudi Arabia, it's avoiding the Egypt Suez Canal, that is much more expensive for them. So that's also, and Saudi Arabia is actually interesting because Saudi Arabia, um, we don't have, like Israel doesn't have a, you can maybe jump to Saudi Arabia. Um, Israel doesn't have um, um, an official diplomatic relationship with Saudi Arabia, but uh, really, really close actually cyber um, connections between both countries. Also, official, but not official visits, there were visits that were, like, were um, reported about from also Netanyahu. Um, but the, the most, yeah, that's one case that was going really public. That's um, Jamal Khashoggi, um, a Saudi Arabian journalist living in the States in Washington, working for the Washington Post, and um, going here into the um, embassy, the Saudi Arabian embassy in Istanbul, and never, come back, never came back. He was actually killed um, in the embassy. And later it was um, reported and proved that actually um, Saudi Arabia spied on him through an Israeli technology from an Israeli company that's called NSO. I bet you heard this name. It's really, really a lot in the media now. NSO, um, yeah, it was used to spy and to see if he's coming and to see where he is. And it led to his killing. Um, actually, in 2020, also other journalists from Al Jazeera were hacked using Pegasus, also most likely from by Saudi Arabia. Um, and that's Yossi Cohen. It's just another small, I don't know, uh, example. It, he was the head of the Mossad, the, the security agency, the Israeli security agency. 
um, and he visited Saudi Arabia two times together with Netanyahu. And uh, one time with Netanyahu, one time without Netanyahu, he visited Saudi Arabia. And also interesting to see these connections today, he is he's owning a cyber, cyber company that is doing facial recognition technologies, like an Israeli cyber security. Um, and are there, are there other, you talked about the UAE, Bahrain, maybe in the future Saudi will normalize, mm -hmm. are there other countries which normalized with Israel recently? Ah, yeah, of course. We, um, Morocco is a really great example for that. So um, I think it was in December after that that Israel also signed the normalization agreement with Morocco. And it was, of course, part of the US initiative, the Trump initiative. Um, but in fact, Israel and Morocco have have had close economic, diplomatic, and military ties for many years before. And um, in 2013, for example, um, seven years before, Mor the Moroccan Air Force um, bought heroin drones, so drones that we saw also in India and in other places, and um, they bought heroin drones to be um, for use in Western Sahara. So they built for $50 million heroin drones already in 2013. Actually, a few days ago, I think a week ago, it was uh, reported that they did a, a $200 million deal for kamikaze drones. You remember the kamikaze drones in Azerbaijan? So now Morocco also bought them to use them in, in Western Sahara. It's also important to say Western Sahara is, uh, yeah, here you can see Benny Gantz actually, I think a few weeks ago, I don't remember the, the exact date, doing an official visit. Benny Gantz is the uh, defense minister of Israel right now. Um, maybe go to the next picture. Ah, yeah, just um, Jerusalem being after the agreement. And that's the Western Sahara. And so Western Sahara is also occupied by, by Morocco. And 350,000 people live there, most of them indigenous to the area. And human rights uh, organizations are reporting for years about serious human rights relations by Morocco there including oppression and killing of local um, local inhabitants um, and it's, for me it's interesting because it's the same it's not the same story but it's, i think it's the same i don't know the same technologies and the same products and and weapons that are used here um to to oppress a minority or indigenous community being now used there that's the kamikaze one again that was sort to to Morocco and a few weeks, like it was enough. And we said NSO, so NSO was also used by Morocco in this, um, in this case on, um, on this journalist that um, it was one of the most famous journalists that were criticizing Morocco on their um, actions in the Western Sahara. And he was um, arrested uh, using NSO technology on him, spying on him. and and um, yeah using the evidence against him um i think i have just yeah, one i think we go back to yeah. our region here i'm yeah. sorry it's really but long the last question i think is how does it connect to here you know we talk about this idea of them all being battle tested and can you maybe kind of link us back to to how this affects you know palestinians more than anyone yeah. else here on the ground yeah, so it's all starting here, actually. Um, and um, it's important for me to say, it's not that we're the only country in the world. Uh, we're not the first one, we're not the main one uh, that is producing arms and they're selling it to, to problematic <laughs> places. But exactly what I want to talk about it now, that's the important and the, the important perspective why we're doing this event, actually, and why it's important to talk about Israeli arms export and uh, about this industry. Um, Israel produces, um, is arms as part of its power on the Palestinian people. It's, it's important to say um, on the Palestinian people in the like, occupied territories, and it produces new weapons and military tactics. And not only producing it, it's after that selling it. And the companies after, and that's a, actually a good example, we talked about the US-Mexico border, and maybe you can open this picture a little bit bigger. And um, that's actually two weeks, no, that's last week, and Benny Gantz, the same guy we saw in Morocco, um, they, fi they finalized the process of building a fence and a technology, like uh, a complete closure of Gaza from all directions, also in the sea and also on, the, um, on land. And here they're celebrating the, 
the com com I would say completion of it. Um, so you, you can see they they're using it here. They they're producing it here. They bring it to the to outstanding capabilities, um, and then selling it, of course, as an operational product, um, a battle-tested product. That's a good example here. You can see soldier. Um, th those drones, mini drones, are used in Gaza a lot by by um, by army units, and they're after that marketed as as battle-tested and as um, yeah, another example, 2017, the first time it was used was on on the march of return, Palestinian demonstrations on the border in Gaza. It was the first time it was used. It was the first time it was tried. They actually experimented on protesters, this kind of drones that is throwing um, gas, um, gas um, grenades. Um, and then after that, is we're selling it or marketing it, as an operational experience gained through tens of thousands of operational hours by the by the IDF, by the Israeli army. Um, in other ways, they boast about the way the technologies have been tested on the Palestinian population to improve the degree and speed of killing and aiming. And um, the last example, no, but actually maybe before before the, the last attack, um, in 2014, it's, an, it's a good example also. In 2014, there was an attack on Gaza, an operation, and drones were used for surveillance and attack. Actually, in, this, in, the, in the war and in the attack in 2014, 1,400 Palestinian civilians were killed, 17,000 houses were ruined. And Elbit, we talked about Elbit before a lot, Elbit, the same ones that also supplied surveillance systems on Mexican border, and of course, sold to Azerbaijan weapons <laughs> to India. So they marketed it themselves as supplies of the Israeli Defense Force after this war in Gaza in 2014. And after that, in the month of July, in 2014 alone, in the month of this war, its profit increased in six in six percent. At the peak of the assault on Gaza already, the, the, say, the sales went up and the profit um, they gained profit. And after that, they exported, of course, to, to more countries, selling it. Um, I just wanted to show the, I don't know, it's, I think it's clear for everyone what, what is happening there. Um, but maybe the next picture is interesting because now we're trying also, that's actually an example of, of a research we did um, at the beginning of a research. It's really just looking exactly what you saw before, like propaganda videos of the army different um, videos online, of course, media reports, and to just make a list what arms were used to start to see how those, trend, those marketing trends are developing, what new arms were used, how they, how they will be exhibited in the next arms fair or um, so like shown in the next video of Elbit and IAI and the, the, all the countries. So that's how our research sometimes starts to also see those connections between the marketing, um, yeah, the marketing methods, and of course the profit that the, those companies make. That's also a great example. That's now in May, after the last attack, um, that is a press release that they by now they deleted actually, but we have it. We have a screenshot. Um, IAI is really air, is really aerospace industry. They made a press release in the in the first of June. So it's. I think a week after the, the end of the attacks on Gaza. They say drones from the Heron family, that's this drone that we saw a lot. Drones from the Heron family are the most prominent of the IAI drones and played an important and crucial role in collecting intelligence in Operation Guardian of the Walls. That's the name of the attack. Um, and this uh, was a press release on a two billion sale of Heron drones. Um, it's less than two weeks after the ceasefire. Um, so we see that. that they're always doing it. We, we have a lot of examples and brochure on like flyers of those companies um, celebrating thousand hours, thousand hours, thousand flight hours for the drone in operation, blah, blah, blah. Um, so um, that's another example. I think I want to jump just to another example that is not so clear because the drones and the, the bombs, we're seeing them a lot, but now we have a new. Um, sector um, and that's uh, cyber and 
in this case, facial recognition. <clears throat> so a few weeks ago, two testimonies of soldiers um, back in the silence and the Washington Post um, exposed that already and um, that the army and also settlers actually, but the army is um, building a huge database and is um, photographing Palestinian civilians and um, using facial recognition technologies. Um, in Hebron, in uh, the West Bank, in the past, uh, an Israeli company that was uh, financed by Microsoft, and actually Microsoft divested from them, were using uh, facial recognition systems, also uh, technologies on, on the checkpoints, um, also surveilling of the Palestinians. And actually, maybe you can jump to, to them, because facial recognition, I mean, Israel, it's not only Israeli companies that are developing facial recognition technologies, but here we have proof that it was used already on, on Palestinians. Um, we don't have proof on, on usage on, on Israeli civilians inside 48 borders, um, but it's, it's a, a sector that is developing. We, we see a few Israeli companies already um, and making deals with other countries, with the UAE, with Mexico, or with Thailand, um, on facial recognition systems. Um, and Anivision, actually, maybe you can go, maybe, maybe you can jump to Anivision's office in Israel. Um, yeah, Anivision um, is now, is, they changed their name, actually, because they were so criticized on their, on their involvement in the, in the surveillance of Palestinians that they changed their name to Usto today. That's the um, company's building close to Tel Aviv. And actually all cyber companies, most of them are really, really, they're, they're not even criticized enough in the, in the Israel public opinion. Um, one of them celebrates that we talked about before, actually I didn't put the, put, the, put the picture, but they're now recruiting workers and they have commercials all like in YouTube and on bus stations. And so they're like um, just a normal high startup company and recruiting new work, like young workers. And like we saw, um, they're involved in human rights relations in Hong Kong. I didn't talk about it, but Celebrate alone is involved in Hong Kong, in Belarus, in White Russia, in, in Bangladesh, and in a lot of other um, countries. And it's quite uh, normal for, uh, for the Israelis. Um, any vision here, it's a picture of a campaign against them, but um, that was the campaign against Microsoft when they they um, put pressure on them to divest from this company. Um, maybe it's interesting to talk a little bit about the cyber, like more about the cyber sector, because um, it's really, really increased, like it's really getting bigger and bigger. And um, it's, it's be it become a key player in the global cyber technology market, actually. And it's also because of the experience and knowledge that is really the sector built on their experience on Palestinians and on, on different conflicts here. Um, actually, um, acquisitions of Israeli cyber companies generated $5 billion in 2020 alone of 4.7. Um, and Israeli cyber exports stood at, at $6.85 billion in 2020. It's a huge number. And it's always characterized by, by those ties between, between um, industry, military, academia, and government. It's all connected. And this picture, for example, shows the location of, of a huge intelligence unit, um, the Israeli army intelligence unit. And we see it's always, it's the bridge. These units are the bridge from soldiers getting experience and, and knowledge and then building their own IT companies, cyber companies, um, and developing those technologies and then of course exporting it to whoever gives more or whoever gives something and doing profit out of it. Um, and it's also it's like the latest chapter in the long history of exporting re repressive technologies to authoritarian regimes. Um, and you can you can see all of that in the database. And that's actually just a picture of the homepage. Um, but the database um, yeah maybe I just say something yeah, I think that Israel refuses to publish the data itself. I said, like, I said it already. The government works within a, a, like a legal framework that doesn't demand transparency or monitoring of, of the arms export. And exactly this is what, what the database, like this data is crucial for, for us, for activists, 
for human rights defenders, for um, journalists, for the public. And, um, and this is what we try to expose with information. And uh, actually, the Quaker organization, AFSC, um, uh, yeah, they did a great job. They, over the past year, we collected like, publicly available information on, on a lot, a lot of countries. We have 50 countries now in the database. And more than 50 products also like arms, I think 15 companies now that we analyzed and, and researched about. And um, by using that, we're building a tool for everyone who wants to use that and, and um, work with that. And yeah, and doing like, yeah, ex criticizing this, this whole connection between capitalism and, um, and the conflict and occupation. And maybe it's, it's important to say by maintaining, and that's just to end maybe, by maintaining the, the regime of occupation over the Palestinian people, Israel gains economically, um, like I said, by having a testing ground for the development of weapons, of security systems, and, and also models of population control, surveillance, cyber, facial recognition, and tactics, racial profiling, and without it, Israel will be unable to compete in the international arms and security markets because you, ha you have bigger, bigger industries. Um, but it gives Israel a status of, uh, as a major military power, like we said, the number eight in the world. Um, and now maybe we can talk about it together, about what can we do against it. As I put just some pictures at the end, just to, show, just to keep like a little bit of an optimistic um, ending. Um, but we should aspire to building a sustainable alternative to this world of profit-driven militarism and violence. And here we can see a, a protest that we organized against NSO that was quite successful and is now in every, every article about NSO actually shows our protest and not, not the office of NSO. Here's an, a coalition of organizations that are fighting against the militarization of, of borders in Europe and against the you know, Frontex. You see South Korean activists um, fighting against a huge South Korean arms company. Um, and actually also we're using a lot of, of activists and volunteers that are going to arms exhibitions and are filming what is being sold there, who is going there, what delegations, the connections. So it's also important, I don't know, if someone is interested to, to uh, I don't know, share information, it's always interesting if someone wants to, to go to those weird events. Um, but it's also a part of, of our uh, resistance. And you have more radical protests. Here's a group that is called Palestine Action in the UK. Every week, I think they, they're shutting down a different Elbridge factory of drones. Um, and they're doing it more uh, on the ground and more, uh, yeah, um, civil disobedience. And I think it's important to see the, the struggles together. I just put a picture from the protest. Um, but I think the, the, the anti-military struggle must uh, do a relation between, between international, anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-capitalist um, struggles. And then, yeah, and, and on one side target the allied opponents of progressive values and basic human rights on the other. And that's what I want to say for the end. Um, Thank you. Thank I don't you. have a voice anymore. I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan. Really, I mean, the way you draw those connections is uh, very powerful. And, you know, I think when we look at that map of the database you're building, you know, I feel like we could have extended this event for like hours and hours more. You know, there's so many, so many other connections that we, we could have gone into. But uh, I think you did a great job of kind of showing us the, the most important ones. And, um, Thank you everybody for sitting patiently uh, as Jonathan and I discuss some of these issues. Uh, but now is the chance for you guys in the audience to share your thoughts, comments, feedback, and questions. Um, if anybody has a question that they want to share with me in the chat, you're more than welcome. Um, and you can, uh, yeah, ask Jonathan um, for maybe clarifications or, or uh, any questions that you may have. We have the next 20 minutes for you. David, go ahead. You've raised your hand. David Rosenberg. I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm David Rosenberg from Jewish Socialist Group in England. Um, 
and yeah, it was really, really fascinating talk, really interesting. Um, I was, I'm very interested in particular around um, what you were saying about the, um, uh, the surveillance equipment that is being used to, uh, against migrants and refugees in various countries. Um, I wondered if, if there's, you have any information about um, that in relation to Poland and, and at the moment the, the, what's happening on the Poland-Belarus uh, border. I mean, we're very active in, in our country mm. in working with Polish groups who are supporting um, the migrants who are or to be able to come in and it'll just be in, and we've been following events in Poland quite closely so it'll be interesting to know something about that and also um, Hungary as well uh, and, and um, all that I'm thinking about the sort of quite anti-semitic pro-Zionist but anti-semitic regimes in sort of Central Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all, good question. Actually um, we have now a researcher working on, on Belarus, a Russian speaker also to do, doing starting research on, on Belarus because it's missing in the database I need to say. We have a little bit of information about Russia but not about Belarus still um, and also Poland is still missing in the database I need to say. Um, but yeah, European countries, not only European countries, we, we saw us in the US, uh, are increasingly using the surveillance and especially actually smartphone surveillance to, to investigate asylum seekers. We, I still, and I think, I don't know if someone else um, is doing the research, I didn't find, and I, I need to say that I didn't search also, I didn't do like a, a specific research on, on, on the Belarus, Poland um, situation right now. And um, so on that case, in this case, I don't have proof that there's Israeli technology involved, but in, the, in a lot of other, um, and it's not only me, uh, different other organizations like Access Now and Privacy International, and also journalists um, exposed different users of, of Israeli smartphone surveillance on asylum seekers in Germany. They did an, uh, an attempt in working with, with this with Celebrite uh, technology in Denmark also they expanded laws enabling immigration officials to conduct examination of, of people's phones um, and UK and Norway actually are, have been carrying out practice for years on, on migrants um, in Austria also a, a, a similar law was passed on, on like enabling it so we, we see also a shift in, in policies and in, in laws and we see also actually proof on the usage already. Um, UK made a payment of 45,000 um, um, pounds to Celebrite in, in 2018 for the for technology. And actually, the, our page on Celebrite is very really interesting. I did a really, really, really um, deep investigation on Celebrite. We have I put a lot of um, different countries there. You can see it in the database. And also in Morocco, we see it. And Actually, also the EU, we're trying not to see if the EU officially also, also, is also working with Celebrate. And um, we don't have, I didn't find it yet, but we see a development on, on surveillance, not only from the bar, not only drones and facial recognition, but also from the phones. And actually Celebrate is marketing, and it's always important for me, this marketing perspective, because it's interesting. They officially say on their, on their I don't know, um, commercial, um, they said, and I don't know if exactly in this word, but they said um, every migrant, not all, not all migrants are coming with a passport, are crossing with a passport, they're all crossing with a, with a phone. So use our technology, that's why, why we're here for. And so we see those developments in a lot of different borders in Europe, and also of course in the US and in other places. And I hope that I somehow could answer, but you can go into the database and look a little bit into that more and more into that. And also other reports. If you if you need, I put my email here. I can share also other diff interesting resources for that. As sources, I mean like information and, and and of course every one of you you could write me after that and we've been in touch. Thanks for the question, David. Um, can I ask uh, Hillary next? You had an interesting question. Are you there, Hilary? Uh, yeah, um, it's about, uh, so I'm based in the UK, um, the protests that you've mentioned against the Albit factories and, um, you know, they've been going on for a number of years, but yeah, have es escalated. And I just wondered, I mean, people often are wondering, 
What is Elbit's interest in being in the in the UK? Um, is it the expertise of engineers at the sites they've taken over, or is it you know, or is it more about developing its relationship with the government to get contracts with the UK government, which has happened increasingly? Or uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, and I suppose it's related to. Uh, what chance have we got of getting Elbit out of the UK? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the first question is, a, is a, it's too good the question. I actually can't, I, I need really honestly to say, I don't know. We, we're not, I, the, easy answer, the easy answer is for profit. They have a lot of subsidiaries all over the world. They have in Australia, a whole company in the US. They, they build factories all over the world. So for me, the easy answer would be like just another good place to work. I, I don't know what really is the, the exact thought of, behind it and how it increases their sales or their expertise. I'm really sorry. I could share it maybe with, with other researchers or journalists and, and shut every down. I think public uh, pressure, a, a lot of times it works. So I think, uh, if, I, I don't know if they're continuing now. I think a few weeks ago I saw another action by them. And I think if it would be more in the mainstream also and more, uh, yeah, the more uh, public pressure, the companies, like we see now is in a slow, the public pressure is so big, the international pressure is so huge that they're actually talking about selling the company now and getting, yeah, um, so I think it always could work. I'm, I'm a little bit optimistic and just like more public pressure, the more the best, like the better, but thanks. Say exactly what, what could happen. And I just, uh, I was asked in the chat if the video was recorded. So I think um, Alex has said it, it's being recorded and will be on the YouTube of, of Queen Olive too as well. Exactly. exactly. Um, thanks, Helen. Uh, Nick, you've raised your hand. Do you have a question for us next, Nick? A very similar question to what Hills was saying. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but Palestine Action have done a lot of actions on the roof of Elbit factories in England. Um, I think there's a lot of court cases coming up and it's really how effective do you think this is ultimately on Elbit? Will it affect their factories, their work processes in England? Um, and really just what sort of difference do you think all these actions are actually making on Elbit? Mm. I think it would be more, I, I think maybe Palestine Action could answer that better. Um, I think it's always, for me personally, as an activist, it is also uh, doing actions in, in here and locally. Um, it's also always a question of, of blocking a factory and shutting it down for a few hours, how much. I think it's not about the numbers of, of, of loss for one day or, or how, how much it affects the profit from. And I think it's more like really the, not the image only, but the, really the public pressure of, of direct actions against the factory, seeing that every week a different factory is being, um, I think it's, it's you know, like they're painting it with, in red for blood. And, um, and I think there's more, more, like more writings about it, more publications uh, about the work from, about their involvement in human rights relation in Palestine, but also abroad. So I think, I'm not, I'm not sure that there's a direct effect, but I think that the, the global, not the global, but the public, um, the reputation effect, uh, the, the pressure on their, um, on their managers and on their workers, I, I bet it, have a, it has an effect. But it's also only a personal opinion. But I, I'm, I'm sure that person in, act, person in action in the UK, the, the group that is doing that, I bet they have an answer for why they're doing it, what is their belief, what is their goal. Um, but yeah, yeah I'm not in connection with them. it does seem like this is somewhere where you know ordinary people and individual activists can have you know quite some impact it's it's kind of the yeah idea. we saw actions and there's actually also a lot of in, already in, in Belgium and in Europe there are a lot of really creative small actions that made a crazy impact on, on different companies in arms fairs in conferences and I don't know, in divesting, universities are divested from different companies because of student pressure, and museums are divested from different companies, not only in arms, but um, it always uh, makes an, it has an impact. 
public pressure and creative protests and, and criticism. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Um, I had a question which came to me before I was disconnected, unfortunately, so I don't remember who asked it, but uh, I'll do my best to kind of summarize. And if the person who asked it wants to follow up, they're more than welcome to. But there was a question about um, Israel's motivation, specifically in selling to places like Azerbaijan, which are you know, Muslim countries, Shia majority countries, and how that kind of fits into this kind of geopolitics. And, and is, does Israel kind of pick and choose who they sell weapons to, or is there kind of a bigger picture here? And maybe you could address, address that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So I need to say, and it's important for the database, for the database and for our work, we, just, we decided really, and just to, to give the, the background for, for the answer, um, we decided really early that we won't look into like into reasons of arms deals, in, into um, the explanation of why this arms deal was done with this country, what is the diplomatic or geopolitical background, what stands behind it. For example, we looked on, I don't know, Indonesia, and we saw that they made quite a lot of, uh, of pro-Palestinian um, statements, and a week after that, they, they bought crazy amount of weapons from, from Israel. So we saw that it's not, it, ma it doesn't make sense for the database and we don't need it um, to, to give the whole reasons behind the oil or here the, the diplomatic decision sometimes for opening an embassy somewhere. Or, so I need to say that we're not, we, we're looking a lot of on our economic relations and it's important for us to see the, the different agreements and what is leading to an, a, a cyber deal or a, not, a, not an only deal but an, an official um, agreement between countries and also the import and export um, and, and uh, the relation like the arms export in relation to other exports from different countries but we, we need to say that we don't analyze geopolitical reasons. I know that in, in Azerbaijan specifically it's known um, that it, there's like a lot of, of um, yeah oil <laughs> behind that um, but I, I don't I'm also we, we always it's not about conspiracy theories but we're, we're really trying not to try because we're not experts in that there's so many different research institutes and academics that are looking into geopolitical um, yeah, developments and, and decision making and yeah, it's less our our expertise. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. All good. Um, we still have another five minutes or so, so probably time for another couple of questions. Did anyone send anything to you directly? This is a. Uh, I haven't got any other questions pending unless uh, you do. If anyone has a question and they want to just unmute themselves, you're very welcome to do that. I do. Go ahead, John. How are you? Thank doing? You. Hi. Um, at least here in the United States, Israel keeps a very strong focus on Iran all the time as an existential threat and a weapons exporter. Could this be a sort of smokescreen to take attention away from Israel's own nuclear program and exports of, well, military equipment, weapons, cyber training? targeted assassinations. It seems such a deliberate policy of focus on Iran all the time. What's the view from where you are? Oh, again, uh, a big question that I'm, I'm actually also not, I, I think I'm not the, the, the person to... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, and I don't know, it's such a, a complicated, uh, I mean, not, not, I, I think I am standing behind what you, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think I understand the question and then I would also maybe think that or look into, or it could be one of, of the explanations, but I'm really, I'm not, Iran is really like, I don't know, a black hole for me, the whole situation. With that. I'm really honest with you. That, um, and I think a lot, and actually sadly, but a lot of activists here and occupation activists and, and general, it's, it's it's hard to to understand what stand behind that and what is the, the exact situation there and yeah the skill political and the U.S. connection and uh, I don't know it's not not my topic I'm sorry <laughs> sorry that I have a lot of answers here that I yeah <laughs> well I'll add a word I'm also definitely not an issue, <laughs> an issue but I definitely think there is a link between you know, the, the UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Israel, these kind of deals 
are definitely, and you could even add perhaps Azerbaijan to this list, definitely some sort of connection. How deep, I guess, is a, a question for other people. But, um, you know, Iran is definitely kind of pushing some of those unlikely allies together. So I definitely think you can say that much. How realistic a threat Iran is to Israel, how much of a smoke screen it is, yeah, I guess Jonathan's right. That's kind of a, a bigger question. But, uh, yeah, there's definitely, Iran is is a big factor in, in a lot of these deals. I'll definitely uh, stand by that much. But thanks for the question. Really good, two good questions. <laughs> Wonderful. So, my friends, we are pretty close to our 90-minute deadline. Maybe have time for one more question if anybody has, uh, has something burning that they want to uh, ask or a comment they'd like to share. And if not, I guess we can start to wrap things up. I just say thank you that, you're, that you came and that you're interested in this topic. I hope it was not too fast and too much numbers and names and uh, facts. Um, but I'm here also like on, you have my email, you have the database, um, you can stay in touch, you can ask for more information about something or we always need, we also always need help. I mean, help is an amount of, of sharing information with us that maybe we didn't get to is like an activist from Finland a few weeks ago sent me so much sources that he had from in, in, like in Finn in Finnish um that we couldn't get to because it's not in our language so we always are happy to share information and uh, of course knowledge but um yeah and of course we we're also happy to talk i mean if if you are in a group or an activist group and you want another meeting with me or with my partners and we're always also happy to meet and talk and give a presentation and yeah we want to to make it more like a global joint anti-military struggle. It's not only about Israel, it's part of, of a bigger struggle, of course, but we're happy to help and being part of other coalitions and groups. So feel free. Well, let me also add, thank you very much, Jonathan. Really, this wouldn't have existed without you and the amazing work of your colleagues, you know, building the database and all the behind the scenes stuff you're doing. So really, you know, great job. Um, and I'm sure there's plenty of people in the audience and around the world who want to get behind this and support it. And it does, like we said, I think a couple of times seem like an issue where you know, ordinary people really can uh, help make a help make a big difference. So we thank you for that. And of course, if you don't have time to, uh, you know, volunteer, you can also leave a contribution. And um, there was apparently a, a problem with the first link I sent. A few people said they couldn't access it. So I pasted another link down there in the chat uh, where you can leave whatever you felt today's session was worth. Like I said at the start, that'll support the Green Olive Collective, um, Jonathan and his colleagues at uh, building the database, and of course, this great um, Palestinian children's charity. So uh, we really do thank you very much for joining tonight. Uh, we thank everybody who'd like to contribute something um, for the work we put in to build this session. And um, very big thanks to you, Jonathan, again, for, for leading, the, leading the way and uh, really illuminating a lot of really important information. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Jonathan. I think you are very brave to be doing this kind of work. So congratulations on your bravery to yourself and your colleagues. You are not liked by the Israeli authorities at all. That has to be said. So keep going, keep it up. You have all our support, all our support. Thank you, that's very great and empowering. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. So enjoy the rest of your days, wherever in the world you are, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Bye-bye.